Welcome back to another episode of Scott Shower. This is episode 95, and this is Noah. This is Jesse. All right, well, for this evening, we have the uh, Oban, the Oban special uh, release of 2022. Um, I believe it's Cask Strength, uh, which should be kind of fun. I like, I do like the bottling. I love the purple, <laughs> uh, the purple rabbit on there. Um, then from there, we're going to have our shout outs and get it togethers. Followed by a restaurant review of P.F. Chang's and then our smart challenge of you. All right. So as mentioned, this is the special release 2022 Obin 10 year scotch released by Diageo. They had one last year, which we were not so lucky to procure. Uh, but this year, Noah was able to fetch this bottle. Uh, it is a handsome canister, it is fun to look at. This is the Celestial Blaze. As our legend goes, a vivid blaze of light grew against the ink black sky above Obin, driven by a celestial being. A sprightly and energetic creature carried on the stars, charged across the heavens, and showered the sky in an explosion of violent brilliance. Shedding its ethereal light on the Obin distillery, an intense vibrancy in the grounds with hues of plum and blackberry, infusing Obin with an otherworldly character rarely seen. On a rare autumn night at Obin Bay, the shimmering lights of the Aurora Borealis illuminate the giant so the coastal town, it's a quaint coastal town, and its namesake distillery, one of the oldest and smallest distilleries in Scotland. In 1794, Oban Rose bringing that electric energy to the quiet surroundings. Small as it may be, its ebullient nature has been written in the stars for centuries. Maturing in refill and new American oak, the double maturation in ex sherry and Amon Pilato seasoned casks bring a mild nose with a maritime salt and sea air. The creamy texture infuses a taste rich in sweet hints of wine, poached, spiced plum, balanced by vibrant salt and spice before finishing as chili pepper. Rich, sticky sweetness sparkles through the light, smoke, and salt in an oban of stellar character. Out of all of that, <laughs> what I kind of got out of it was uh, for Obin, they're like a power animal or a spirit animal or whatever it is. Like when you like we go back to like Fight Club, is the uh, purple rabbit. <laughs> we do have the purple rabbit. <laughs> Cocaine bear. <laughs> Cocaine bear. See the hat. <laughs> couple things to mention I think that really are important to take away from that is they do have those ex-bourbon American oak casks, the new American oak casks, and then they are finished in that Amontillado sherry cask, um, which I think is what is supposed to bring the blackberry and plum to life with this fine scotch. 57.1% ABV, so definitely up there near, if not not truly cast strength. Uh, that is a steep percentage of alcohol in there, but Oban has not let us down with strong flavor as well. Uh, with the Oban distillery mentioned, you know, it's a Highland single malt scotch. Uh, Oban is the little city, uh, quaint little city there uh, off the coast. And um, 1794 we're talking about centuries the brothers before their mother was widowed um, actually opened a brewery there they moved to the town or at the time it was just a town and um, started a brewery while in the meantime they were fixing boats that's what they were doing to put food on the table um, started a brewery later changed it to a distillery and here a couple hundred years later <laughs> We've got some fine single malt scotch. Yeah, if you go back and you visit some of our earlier episodes that we uh, where we talked about Oban, we do uh, dive a little bit deeper into the the historical sense of Oban and its uh, and some of the great characteristics of them. 
um, which definitely happens to be with how close they are to the to the seashore. Absolutely. With uh, basically, you're you're definitely within drunk stumbling distance <laughs> of uh, drowning, <laughs> of drowning, going from the distillery <laughs> to the shore. Man, such a pretty bottle. It's almost hard to open this. Yes, but it is our job to taste it. <laughs> it, it and that's that's what we do. <laughs> Life is great. Life is great. I mean, that's <laughs> we get to do this. All right. Much like the canister, the bottle itself, great label. Oben, again, has not let us down. Diageo, whether or not you love huge corporations buying up multiple liquor distilleries, they've done a nice job with their bottling uh, and their presentation for sure. You don't have anything else you want to kick out there for Oban? No. I still think of Violent Night every time I see an Oban and the fact that the son gives his mother, his mother her favorite bottle of scotch, which happens to be an Oban single malt 14-year scotch. Yeah, I think he missed the boat there. He really should have gone with the 18-year-old. <laughs> but I guess if that's her favorite is a 14, then, you know, 14 is good. It is. It is. All right, great foil, great detail, real wooden top on the cork still. You ready for this? I'm ready. <laughs> that must be Jesse's cup. <laughs> glug, glug, glug. <laughs> All right, um, off to our uh, warp speed and our tasting. So cheers. Cheers. Life is great, as you have, <laughs> as you have stated before. I mean, we. I mean, here's the thing. The reason why I'm saying life is great, and where I normally wouldn't, is that we get to try multiple or like tons of different scotches over 95 different weeks. Uh, you're talking about 95 different scotches, ni almost 95 different restaurants. Because I mean, there's been some times where we've uh, cooked, uh, like grilled some stuff on our own. Um. So, yeah, I mean, this is a, we get to try these wonderful scotches. And this is another wonderful scotch. And it has a lot of complexity to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not what I would typically expect from an Oban. I expected a little bit more of the, you know, the, the normal uh, brine forward type of, uh, of elegance uh, to an Oban. Um, it, but this one doesn't really have that one as much as some of the other ones uh, normally would. Um, it does have a lot of characteristics I would expect from a Highland Scotch, though. Um, so here's kind of what, I'm, what I've got from it. When I first look at it with the color, I put myself down as a light straw color. Um, typically, as we've mentioned multiple times, I usually, I usually like the darker colors. Uh, you know, more of a dark copper color or a little bit more amber in this. Uh, however, it, this is still a very, very good uh, scotch. Now, when it comes to the aromas, when you smell, uh, when you smell this particular scotch, I'm getting hints of like vanilla and plum and cherry, uh, along with some hints of. Uh, did I say plum? I think I did, right? So vanilla plum cherry uh, with hints of like a little bit of toffee and clove. And uh, and then when I go to uh, actually sip it and it goes onto my palate, I'm getting a nice creaminess. It's not, it's not, it's, the creaminess isn't as fulfilling as some of these other ones that we tasted like the past couple of weeks where like it totally coats your whole mouth. But there is a definite creaminess there where it does coat uh, at least the tongue portion of your mouth. And here... I am once again picking up some ripe plum because you're getting some of the sweetness, but that's not what hits me first. Actually, what hits me first is the spice. And I think the spice is really a combination of cinnamon and clove. And so you're getting like the cinnamon and clove followed up with this 
nice sweetness of like uh like orchard fruit or maybe like like a like a fresh like summertime like uh like a like a ripe plum that sweetness of a plum uh, with some with a very very mild hint of brine in there, you still ca- you can still capture a little bit of the brine uh, that you would get from a normal oban, but it's really like this one's a lot more on the mild side than most of their other uh, other their most of their other um, bottles that they put out. But that spice does really carry into the finish, and you and and in the finish, this is where you really where I notice. A whole lot more of that cinnamon and clove with some tobacco, and there is a slight hint of freshness of mint. Okay, and that mint, uh, kind of like because you know, like if you, I don't know if, if you like, well, I guess if you ever smoked a cigar <laughs> or if you ever smoked cigarettes or even cloves, you have that like that lingering taste in there, but you don't get like that lingering, like awful taste of the tobacco or anything like that because of that fresh hint of mint that's in there with it. So you get that nice hint of the cinnamon and, and clove followed with some bad taste of tobacco with like a, uh, uh, with some mint in there to kind of keep it nice and refreshing. It's a nice lingering finish. It's more of a light body though, medium, uh, light body to medium body scotch for me. Um, it's definitely worth the money. And I think there's also more complexities in there because um, I've tasted it again, um, not as I'm I, as I'm giving this, but right before I did give this, um, I did get, I think, maybe, maybe maybe even some hints of apple in there. But um, in any case, it's still uh, it's still opening up here. And, and I think as we go through the show, it'll, it'll actually release some more of the nice characteristics that it has. Um would I share this with a good friend? Most definitely. <laughs> would I take this to a poker night? No, I would not. Um, would I take this to uh, a dinner party or a nice event? Yes, I would. Uh, unlike some of the other ones that we had in previous weeks where I said it would be a black tie affair, this one doesn't necessarily have to be a black tie affair. It just has to be you know, a nice gathering. Um, where I know there would be other people there who would appreciate scotch. Um, this is definitely one I think if you're able to get more than one bottle, have one bottle, at least a drink, uh, you know, and try some, um, you know, to taste it, and then have another backup or two uh, in your cellar for a later time. It's not like your normal Oban, um, but I do think it's a very great bottle and great showing from Oban. Wow. This is like WWE status here for me, no joke. So, I'm with you. Normally, I think of an Oban as the elegant uh, white party scotch where everyone's wearing a white tux, white suit, white dress. Um, there's no dust. There's no dirt. It's Everything's clean. Um, this is a very different Oban, and it is a ton of fun. And the thing I have to believe right now is that um, part of its amazing complexity does come from the ex casks, the virgin American oak casks, and then that umantejado sherry cask finish uh this is bold and the best way i can describe it is uh you know this this is like a a sylvester stallone rambo scotch (laughs) maybe cobra remember that cobra movie (laughs) sylvester stallone bridget nelson yes now why i bring that up bridget nielsen nielsen okay blonde that is the color of the Scotch Bridget Nielsen also in the Rocky movies where Dolph he, Lundgren Dolph Lundgren is the man. I break you. <laughs> <laughs> that, this is her in that Scotch. Big, bold. Uh, you notice it. You cannot miss this a blonde bombshell of a Scotch. So for me, on the nose. It is amazing to consider all that I get. I get hints of apple. I get hints of honey. The brine is absolutely there. 
And it's also followed with little bits of the teeniest little bit of cocoa and maybe almond. But on the palate, there is no denying. It's not maybe there's this smell, maybe there's that. On the palate, it is all super prevalent. Oh, so on the palate, first thing you mentioned, I agree. This is a creamy scotch for 57.1% ABV. You don't taste the alcohol heat. Um, it is a creamy scotch with fruit forward. I'm getting that cherry, uh, the plum, the currant, the black raspberry. Um, those are in there. They're hidden. Um, but then as you get closer to the mid and finish, um, I get the malt and the barley and then it transitions to clove and cinnamon and you feel it. Uh, it th there is some warmth with this scotch, but it's not a heat from alcohol. It is warmth from the spices. Again, I think that must have a lot to do with their choices in uh, the casks they aged this in. Um, it is non-chill filtered and with that it has a lighter color, meaning they didn't char the hell out of these oak casks uh, they let a little bit of that stay more natural um, so as to give the flavor that it's got as opposed to more of a uh, dark leathery flavor there is no leather here um, but there is absolutely tobacco. I agree with that. Um, I'd hate to think about ruining this scotch with a cigar, but at the same time, I think it might go brilliantly with one. Um, on the finish there, there is definitely that cinnamon. Uh, there is the, the little bit of tannins. The dryness comes through with the, the hints of oak and clove, a uh, touch of ginger, um, and then uh, another interesting flavor I get on the finish is just a little bit of white pepper. That white pepper that's got that kick in that spice and it's delicious. Um, in there somewhere, it kind of in the middle, I take that back. It's right at the front when you get, when I get that creamy uh, touch of oh, immediately from the glass, there is also a hint of peach. It makes that front so welcoming before all the spices kick in and really heat you up. <laughs> um, for me, what I take, uh, sharing this with a friend, absolutely, especially a scotch drinker, this is dynamite. If you can, do get yourself a bottle, even just to try it, if not to save it. Uh, it is fun. It would be a great comparison to have a flight of this with the Oban Little Bay, for example, which we know is completely different, but very much brine and delicious. Uh, maybe the 18 or the distillers. Uh, very, very different by nature than other Ovens. Absolutely amazing. If I know I'm trying to impress someone, and I know they can appreciate a great scotch. I am bringing this to that party because this is the talking point. This will get spoken of for hours, days, weeks after uh, after it because it is that bold. Uh, again, I can't say enough to say this is that blonde bombshell Bridget Nielsen. Um, she stands out and uh, leaves quite the impression. <music> It's time for our shout outs. My shout outs are going to be pretty simple this go around. Um, my shout outs go to really all of my friends and family, yourself included, where we celebrated this holiday and made it not about pressure of gifts at all. So some little things were given here and there. Uh, my kids gave me, because one of our most favorite things, and I know this was a big deal with you growing up with your father, um, one of the most favorite things for my kids and I do is go see a movie. And they got me my peach rings and a movie gift card, which is fantastic because we love to get some snacks at the theater. Um, but it wasn't something that put them in any strain, any financial strain. Um, and that's the same with all of my friends and family this year. Um, so again, some little gifts were given here and there, but it was more about the quality time 
which is what it should be about, than it was about big elaborate trees or decorations. It was about simple decorations and great experiences. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think for me, um, one of uh, an experience I'll, I'll take to the grave is last week's uh, Scotch on Scotch Hour. A great <laughs> one for the holidays. Uh, thank God that coin landed on heads. And, um, you know, it's no different than this one, though. It's, it's an amazing experience. So um, that is my shout out for everyone out there who made the holiday about experience and time and not about gifts. Uh, my shout out is kind of sort of on the similar lines as yours. But mine's going to be for those who host the holiday gatherings. There you go. Um, because that takes a lot. It takes a lot of time and effort. You know, the person who decides to host it at their house, you know, they invite the people over. Uh, you know, if there's like young ones there, they're, you know, they destroy the house, you know, running around, opening up presents. Um, you know, and then you know, got all the cleanup and all the prep work that they put in. So, I think those are those people are the unsung heroes, really, um, of these holiday gatherings for friends and family. And so, uh, I think they they deserve a shout out. Another one, really quick shout out here, and this goes to Coach Prime in the University of Colorado <laughs> uh, for the first time in many many moons. Uh, we're talking like probably since like early two thousands, maybe late nineties. We are in the top 25 of recruiting. We're ranked number 23 right now in recruiting nationally. So that is a huge feat for a university that pretty much all but gave up on their for, on their football program <laughs> and were notoriously bad at recruiting. So I want to give a shout out to Coach Prime and, and everyone involved in that. Ah, my get it together goes to all those bosses out there who are struggling to be leaders and uh, remain difficult bosses as opposed to what everyone needs in these trying times, which is a positive leader. So um, really, uh, it, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you are a leader, make sure you're a leader and not just a boss. Um, remember, some of the most important things are to engage and inspire your team, not to do the opposite, which ultimately demotivates them um, and, and can be very trying. So uh, it, it's a it's a weird situation to think about, but um, that is one of the things that I continue to really try to always be is a good leader, which you can call it a good boss as well, but someone who is always there to support their team, who uh, takes some of the tough for their team and lets their team still celebrate all the victories, never blaming the team, um, owning that piece, but also leading them to get over the tough. Um, I don't have a uh, get it together. I'm, I'm, I'm staying in the holiday season where I'm not going to like uh, say anything bad about anybody right now. Restaurant. So restaurant review this week, we went to the uh, PF Chang's there in park meadows and lone tree. Um, I, uh, I I guess I was the one. Who, it was my week to choose the restaurant. I thought, um, you know, um, let's do something safe for the holidays. You know, something that'd be kind of easy peasy, and uh, you know, we know that we get something decent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, something you would expect. So, um, you know, it was. Unlike some places that we've been to recently, it was well lit, so you can find it. <laughs> the parking lot was lit fairly well enough to where you not feel like you're going to get, like, slashed or something, you know, and that some guy's going to jump out of the bushes and kill you or anything like that. Um, and when you walk in, it's a pretty nice place. I would recommend, though, uh, make sure you make a reservation. Uh, it does get busy there. And uh, it was kind of nice because I made reservations. And like there's like probably like three or four parties of people waiting to get in by time like when I showed up and I was able to get seated within about two minutes. Um, the inside of the place looked pretty nice. Um, something I would expect from a PF Chang's. I expect most PF Chang's look nice on the inside, um, <laughs> and I expect their their food to be good. But here's here's what 
my experience showed me when I first sat down <laughs> at the table. Number one, we had a wobbly table. I, you know, when you sit down at a table, you don't want the table to sit there to be rocking the whole time. Two, uh, the plate that they had sitting on the table, mine was dirty and had like a crusted, like, I don't know what was on there. Something crusty on there. Rice. Just uh, rice. 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 Maybe it was maybe. rice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the table was sticky, so I had to ask the waitress, hey, give me a new uh, a new plate and, and wipe down the table again. And then um, in my silverware, I didn't have chopsticks. <laughs> so and you're supposed to get chopsticks. She seemed surprised when I – she was like, you, you didn't have any chopsticks? chopsticks? I'm like, no. <laughs> So, uh, but the inside, like I said, the, the, the atmosphere, it seemed like people really were enjoying their time. The energy seemed high. Um, I think those were some big missteps right there at the beginning with the plates and uh, the sticky table and not having everything that was supposed to be rolled up in the napkin. Um, from there, uh, my food, I did order, well, we ordered the lettuce wraps. And here, um, usually that's a total win when you go to uh, P.F. Chang's. You know, I think that's like one thing everyone knows about P.F. Chang's. And I haven't been to P.F. Chang's in probably a good, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven years. So it's been a while since I've been there. And they used to like, they used to do like a whole thing when you go and get like these lettuce wraps where they had like, like this like red pepper stuff and some soy sauce and some like mustard or whatever. And they'd mix it up and they ask you like how hot you want your sauce to be. They don't do that anymore. I do I, not. I do remember that now. And uh, they don't do that anymore. They just give you some kind of sauce there. And maybe it's part of inflation. Maybe it's part of COVID. But they give you a lot of like the rice noodle thingy, whatever styrofoam looking noodle things that they are with like very little bit of chicken and the head of lettuce that they gave us. They used to give you like really nice lettuce, uh, like leaf lettuce or something like that to where uh, it was good quality to where you can like put it in there and it's actually like it'll hold together really well. No, they gave us like the shitty, <laughs> I already said it, the shitty, uh, <laughs> like half cut uh, midget <laughs> iceberg lettuce. Baby, baby lettuce. <laughs> and you like, you had a hard time peeling off the, the, the lettuce, um, from, you know, from each other. Uh, and it just wasn't a very good experience, and it didn't taste that great. Honestly, I I, I, made, I made a mention to you that there's other places that we could have gotten better lettuce wraps, and really 20 Mile Tap House in, in Parker, um, you wouldn't think that place would like serve good food when you walk in there because it, it's a total dive bar, but they actually had like way better like uh, chicken lettuce wraps. Um, and then from there, uh, there's a dish I, I used to like getting there all the time, which was the... Uh, uh, ground chicken with um, eggplant, and occasionally in the past, because um, they've they've taken it off the menu for quite a long time ago, but they've always been able to recreate it for me using the same chicken that they use from the lettuce wraps, and with the uh, with the uh, eggplant dish that they now have, and this time they gave me some like, I, I, know, <laughs> I got an upcharge, I got an upcharge for for chicken, but. Um, that definitely was not worth it because it only was like five little pieces of chicken and it didn't even equate to like a, maybe a quarter of a tiny chicken breast that you would get like at maybe noodles and co. So, um, yeah, I just, the food quality <laughs> has gone way down. Um, the taste isn't really quite there at, like it used to be. Um, it's supposed to be sort of family style, but it really just looks like it's enough for like one person anymore. Barely. Barely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm going to give the food a 6.5. Woo! I'm going to give the waitress an eight. I thought she did an awesome job. I thought, I mean, for all the stuff that I complained about, she was pretty snap and she was pretty much on Johnny on spot for, you know, fixing all those errors. Um, the with how they like the the stuff that they did beforehand, like with the dirty plate, the stinky table, spilling drinks on the floor next to us, um, not, not picking up silverware that they dropped. Um, the experience overall, though, I'm just gonna give it a six. The only I think the only redeeming quality there was probably the waitress that we had, and I and I don't even remember what her name was. Otherwise, I'd give her a shout out. But in any case. <laughs> um, 
uh, would I take her first date there? Maybe a long time ago I would have taken her first date there, um, but now I wouldn't because uh, I don't think the quality is there anymore. Uh, would I meet a friend there? No. I think I can find a, a different place to meet a friend or take a first date. For half um, the price. For half the <laughs> price, yeah. Um, than what I got here. Um, so, yeah, overall a six. And uh, I don't know. There's a lot of potential for PF Changs. Um, if they can get back to where they were before COVID or probably like four or five years ago, I definitely give them a much higher rating. But right now, a six is about what they're going to get. PF Changs and the Scotch are completely different. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this scotch is absolutely fantastic, and with that last sip, I definitely, on the forefront, got that white peach flavored with honey. Uh, again, continues to transcend into the spices, the clove, and everything else that's just wonderful about this. I think it's a great winter scotch. Uh, P.F. Chang, so we're talking about the Park Meadows location. Uh, a couple things to mention, it was and is... The day after Christmas, they were pretty slammed, uh, so they were definitely busy. Was super grateful you had made reservations so we could get in right away. Uh, but and I think we're you're right. Our waitress was a win for the experience because she let us know, "Hey, sorry, um, you know, food's coming. It's just taking a lot longer tonight because we're super busy." She was honest and forward about it, and I do also respect that. Uh, going in to the environment. I think the environment has a ton of potential. Uh, for me, especially during the day, we were there after the sun had set to this evening. Um, during the day, though, it can be wonderful. Uh, also, though, at night, good colors, good energy inside. Uh, it could be a fun environment. Uh, food, man, uh, it was a little rough. Like I've never seen lettuce wraps where they expect you to build your lettuce wraps with the center of the head of lettuce. We're talking about that white part where it's not even green anymore. And we're trying to wrap the chicken and other ingredients in there. It was a little difficult. Uh, they were good. They were not great. I went with the Mongolian beef, which was the same. It was good, but it was not great. And finally, um, as the rice choice, went with fried rice. And that was actually a complete letdown. It was like soggy, not firm, not Was flavorful. it really fried rice? I don't the, know. Because part of it was still like white from like white clumpy. Like yeah, steamers. I don't know what the heck they did because um, it was missing some of the vegetables. <laughs> and uh it was it was definitely a letdown so for me i'm gonna agree with you um so for, for me i always have considered pf chang's it's not a fast food restaurant it's not even like bar food it's not the middle of the road i would consider it the lower end of the higher restaurant scale and um with that the food was absolutely a letdown it was definitely a six for me and part of that does also come down to value i agree i remember in the past uh eating lettuce wraps sharing lettuce wraps and getting an entree and having to take some home i was still hungry when we left after eating my entire plate and i finished the fried rice like <laughs> i it was interesting it was definitely interesting uh the waitress i agree with you she was a solid uh i'm gonna say a solid eight as well uh same score as you um would i go there would i take a date there Man, i would definitely go there during lunchtime in the summer when i could sit outside but with this experience this time of night no i don't know that i would take a date there just because for me we waited almost an hour for our dinner after getting our lettuce wraps and that was kind of insane um so for me i don't want that it, it, with a date uh, because otherwise i'll probably just continue drinking <laughs> <laughs> And that towel will get really expensive. Um, they do have a few beers, uh, a few decent choices there, a few nice selections with wine. Uh, again, it has a ton of potential. And that's something I do want to say is because I've had wonderful experiences at P.F. Chang's in the past. It has for me as well been a good couple of years since I've had any of those wonderful experiences. So going back, it was surprising how so much had changed. Like, 
am I just imagining this, or didn't I always used to get the little warm towels with steam water so I could wash and prepare my hands? I I, I don't ever remember you getting that over at PFJ. Maybe I'm just imagining that, but I remember, I thought I remembered the hot towel so I could um, have my hands clean for when I was eating my appetizer. I, I used to love that. And uh, moving from there, the lettuce wraps. Yeah, the lettuce used to be what made the lettuce wrap great. You loaded that meat in there. You got a wrap. And this one was more like a lettuce taco. I got, there wasn't <laughs> enough lettuce to actually wrap it, so it was more of a taco. And um, the, the beef um was good but it was also missing something it it, it was uh, could have been cooked just a little bit longer to the point where it was actually more tender because it had been cooked longer it was a little chewy and uh for me though overall overall experience i'm going to give it a seven the waitress saved the day um our server saved the day and that was just because she was understanding and honest. And really, for me, the biggest piece was she was honest. She's like, she checked in with us regularly, wasn't intrusive. We never ran out of water. If we needed anything, she was there. When you mentioned the chopsticks, she was understanding and immediately got both of us some. And I'm like, all right, well, now I got these funky chopsticks. <laughs> you, got, you, got, you got no chopsticks the first run around. I got... I I don't, somebody's leftover toothpick chopsticks <laughs> or something. It was kind of interesting, um, but it it is it was ultimately good, not great. Um, overall, seven. New year, new you, but really the TV <laughs> series from Netflix called You. And uh, before I jump into you. I just want to say, if you have Netflix, definitely watch Glass Onion because oh, that movie's shit. so <laughs> awesome. Uh, it's a, it's. I mean, if you like Knives Out, it's a fun murder mystery type of movie on Netflix. Uh, I think the characters in there, uh, the actors, did a great job. They, uh, Dave was, uh, Batista. <laughs> He was pretty funny as Duke, always carrying around a, a gun and stuff like in that. His suit. <laughs> Are you really carrying that everywhere with you? <laughs> um, so I do, I do, I do think if you want like a fun, entertaining, like a murder mystery, uh, that's that's a good movie to watch. Um, I wouldn't expect like it's not like a. Uh, an Oscar type of movie, but it's definitely a fun movie. All right. So going into you, um, the premise here is there is this guy who is, uh, um, works at a bookstore. There's three seasons out. He initially, the first season works in a bookstore, comes across a girl, uh, by the name of Beck, uh, gets infatuated with these women and really like, um, he, he puts them like on a, on a pedestal, I guess one would, one might say, and he looks for all the things that uh, could come into this, into the woman of his, uh, focus, uh, into her harm's way and, and tries to eliminate all those harms and, uh, tries to be the, uh, the savior, I guess, uh, or maybe, you know, the perfect person for that, uh, for the woman that his uh, his attention has grabbed onto, uh, the second season uh, obviously didn't go very well for the first the first season <laughs> with the first woman, and then the second season, I think he he meets his match, uh, maybe the polar opposite of his maybe the yin to his yang, uh, but uh, she is not a damsel in distress who needs to be saved, and therefore. Uh, this is where do does a tiger really change their stripes, you know? And that kind of leads into the third uh, season when um, he actually marries that chick uh, from the second season. So there's definitely spoiler alerts here. Um, I, I didn't really design like three different ways of, or three main topics to talk about here. Uh, I guess so. The first thing I'll, I'll, I'll go off with here is out of the three seasons, which is your favorite season? Oh man. It's a tough one. 
Uh, because you mentioned Beck or Guinevere Beck from season one, uh, played by Elizabeth Leo. And I actually thought she played her role well. The first season, uh, it, it, to take a, a step back to season one and really look at it, you're looking at Penn Badgley, who is Joe Goldberg's, that's his name in the show, Joe. Um, he is, you mentioned, he's a book repairman. He takes uh, care of books that are in disrepair and repairs them, making them much more valuable. You got to wonder, where is the truth in that, first of all? Like, I almost feel like that in itself is fraud. He's taking these uh, old books that are busted and making them look new again which they are not it's not the same book so it's an interesting premise though but he absolutely loves a piece of taking something and i think this is the cue for me in the whole show is he loves taking something broke broken and making it more complete making it more presentable making it look better from the outside whether or not it is it's a facade is what it is and so with that first uh season with gwen rebecca um he is looking at this young lady who it, it he sees and starts to follow and starts to basically stalk let's face it this guy's got issues he is a <laughs> serial killer for real and he follows her and soon he starts a relationship with her and yeah she's broken like she is definitely broken in season one she's doing all the wrong things sleeping with all the wrong guys has all the wrong friends and when some of these guys or friends uh do something that he doesn't like joe just kills them <laughs> like that's not going to happen again. So I, I've got to say, I'm, I do respect his resolve. He does, in fact, protect her. He's trying to protect her to the extent of some of her friends there in season one were going out of their way to make her feel bad, to make her look bad. Um, again, social media is a huge piece of season one and the use of it as continues in season two and in season three. And with that, there are there are some of her best friends are making her look like dirt. And he is taking that busted book and putting a clean cover on it by killing them he's getting rid of them and then changing the story they disappear he's protecting her as he sees it and it really becomes tough because it's like he's i think he's pulling the weeds out of out of her life it, you know that's definitely one way to, to to say it um so season one's a lot of fun for me because i'm like i don't i'm not saying i'm gonna do these things this guy did I don't blame him if he is um, protecting his loved one for the things he does, which is he's a serial killer killing people. <laughs> you know, and I, I honestly, I think he at times doesn't, I don't think he has the intent to kill, even though he does kill. He like, or maybe, maybe that's where he kind of has a character flaw because to him, he's like, okay, I'm going to let this guy out. But I don't trust that he has like a peanut issue, and he gives him like a some stuff with like a peanut juice or whatever. It kills him. It kills him. <laughs> so it's interesting because so we've mentioned um, Gwen Guinevere back from season one had issues, and he was trying to fix her. That's how he saw it. Now, what's so interesting is you get to season two. So after season one, yeah, she does not make it, by the way. <laughs> um, he is, but if you really look at the end result for her, he did make her life or made her valuable beyond, beyond life. Right. He, brought, he, he made a, a dead book dead. <laughs> <laughs> he made the dead book dead, but like the book itself thrived and she became a famous author from it. Right. Um, with that, she's no more. <laughs> She gone. So we get into season two. And with season two, he moves to L.A. The heat is on, so to speak, if you will. He's got to move from his uh, smaller town, moves to Los Angeles. I think he lived in New York and Brooklyn. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's really a smaller town. It's not really it. a smaller town, but it's a less hip town, I would say. Uh, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. It, it, it felt smaller. 
then when he goes to LA and all of a sudden all the the real fake people really come out like how do you take the social media plague and expand it while you go to LA so he goes to LA (laughs) and oh man here it gets interesting too because there's a lot of story building up where he builds relationships in this season he's still going around killing people (laughs) <laughs> and he still meets the woman who's ultimately his wife, but he also finds someone that he is, in fact, protecting. But because of her age, and I'm wondering if that's the only thing that saved her is when he met her, her supposed age. You know, she's 12 to 15 years old in the show, even though in real life she was older. Um, is that's why the serial killer didn't kill her but ultimately befriends her protects her with no expectations whereas with all these other ladies he has an expectation yeah but he did hook up with (laughs) her sister well see that's what i mean sister no more (laughs) (laughs) but it wasn't even his fault that the sister died yeah you know i hear what you're saying you play with a match you're gonna get burned (laughs) i mean well I guess it is his fault, but it wasn't like he's the one who killed her. It was his fault. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You trans send into season three. So now the only reason you get to season three the way you do is he gets his... He's like forced to marry her. His soon-to-be wife pregnant, and um, she's pregnant. That's the only reason she's alive at the end of season two. He was planning on ending her there. And you get into season three, and now they've got a baby, a little baby boy, um, baby Henry. Ford. <laughs> and, oh, no, what do they call him, her brother? Forty. Forty, yeah. Forty. They keep calling him Forty. And I'm like, that's just sick and morbid beyond all. Now, where Noah was mentioning that he doesn't need to save this lady is she has more issues than he does. <laughs> Dude, she's also a serial killer. Yeah, I mean, I mean like the, in, in both cases, right? Like with his. Well, first of all, I think we have to kind of. He's broken. I mean, as we as we go through this, as we go through the series, uh, through the series all together, uh, you know, he his mom was getting beaten by. I, I'm assuming I'm not sure if it was a boyfriend or his dad or whatever, but um, I, I think everything starts with the mom here. Because the mom shows him the gun and says, like, we'll never have to worry about him ever again. And he's beating the crap out of, like, not not the dad or the boyfriend. He's beating the crap out of his mom. He pulls the gun out and shoots the guy. And then the mom's, like, basically, like, tosses him off to the side. Like, he did something to protect the woman or, the, the like, the woman figure in his life to make make things better for her. And she discards him and sends him to an orphanage. And then you, and then by the time he's like, he's not even out of the orphanage. I don't think when he meets the uh, the crazy ass book o- bookstore owner, who honestly, if you ever seen the movie Apt Pupil, uh, where the guy like basically uh, gets uh, mentored by a, a Nazi SS uh, guy, this is almost the same kind of scenario here. And basically, the guy is trying to teach him some rules or aspects to live by in life to try to keep him alive and not get in trouble anymore. But Joe takes it a little bit too far. (laughs) And, you know, I think his intent, like, I think if the things didn't go bad with Beck's crappy boyfriend that he ends up killing in the first season, if I think if things would have worked out, well, like it did in the third season with the guy that he captured and let go. Maybe Joe wouldn't have been on like a whole killing spree to begin with, but who who's who's to say? He definitely has some issues. Oh, guys, definitely got issues. And yes. <laughs> and really, when you look at it for him, it's all about like protecting the woman of his life and making things easier for her, so he'll kill or eliminate those obstacles. Whereas uh, love, she will do anything to protect the family. So if there's someone who's threatening the family, she'll kill those people. And so together, like for him, originally he saw her as being fragile, needing like 
obstacles removed. Then he finds out she doesn't need that. And then he's like, yeah, I don't, I, I, I lose interest in her now. And goes and finds a new woman who has obstacles in her life. Whereas love is like, oh, you're now infatuated with a new woman. I'm killing that. I'm killing that person because I'm protecting the family. So that is one way, that's one perspective to look at it. Um, my perspective is a little bit different. My perspective is in season one, Gwen Beck's character was absolutely um, broken as he could see it, and he was controlling how he helped her. And in season two, that continues as he is making the decision when he's killing people, when people were dying. Let's not even say when he is killing people. When people were dying. Because <laughs> he's not always killing them. That's right. When people were dying, he is making the choice of his involvement where he will hide the body or get involved or protect so-and-so or do this and the other. You get to season three now. And this is where I think there it gets really interesting is because Love's character played by victoria pedretti pedretti i think yeah victoria pedretti um she and i think this is a natural becomes very entitled and very free to hurt or kill people whether she's feeling in risk of family or self um, I don't even know if that matters, but what happens is when she starts taking certain actions, she kills someone here, she almost kills someone there, and now Joe's coming in and he is no longer making those choices. He doesn't want any of this. He doesn't want to be killing or hiding bodies. He literally is, to your point, I think he was trying to change. He was trying to put a new book cover on his story, and, he, and she was getting in the way because, shot, well, 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 you pissed me off. Boom. Joe, come clean up my next bloody mess. So <laughs> so here's the question here. Like, she killed two people in season two and never told them what she did with those bodies. And in the third season, she kills one person and has Joe take care of the body. So one has to ask, like, and wonder, like, what'd you do with those other two bodies and get away with it to where now you need Joe to get rid of this one body? She didn't need Joe to get rid of that one body. And should she have just gotten rid of the bodies herself throughout all? Joe would have never had the problem with her. In my mind, I think she became entitled being the wife that he almost killed until he found out she was pregnant and then let her <laughs> live. She became entitled being the wife that now he was responsible for so cleaning here, up her Here's messes. a question. Do you think he would have killed her if she said that she was pregnant with the boy? Because you know, so yeah, he was, he was totally. He caught was up. expecting a girl. Yeah. Um, I think yes. I think he would have absolutely at the end of season two killed a Love Quinn um, if she said she was pregnant with a boy. I think he would have too. But the fact that she was pregnant with a girl and he is like, like let's be honest, he's sexist. And he thinks that females are a weaker sex and that they need his protection. And he gets off on it. So I agree with that. I think, I think because she said, I'm pregnant with our daughter, the key point being the daughter part saved her life. I think if she would have said son, because when, when, the, when the baby was actually born, and they're like, oh, congratulations, it's a boy. And he's like, we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's exactly what he said. I think you're right. He's like, oh, my God. <laughs> and, then, and then, like, the first, what, two episodes, he's always like, I thought we were having a girl. I thought we were having a girl. I thought we were having a girl. That was, like, the way that came out of his mind, out of his mouth. I thought we were having a girl. Yeah, doctors told us we were having a girl. You lied to us, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they just hide their little thing and we can't tell well then he's really fucked <laughs> so i think uh, all together though i really like the second season as my favorite of the three and i think it's mostly because of like the interactions with uh jenna ortega who played wednesday so as you mentioned earlier, the younger girl, when she's like, uh, she's 15 going on to 16 in that show and how he is protecting her. But then you have like the whole development between love and, uh, and him where she knew all about him, but was trying to get his 
evil side, our dark side, to come out so that way she could show her dark side to him. And then the brother. I thought, I think the part that I like, what makes season two better for me is the brother. He's kind of like 40. He's like, <laughs> he's kind of like the comic relief of. Of that of season two until he's not <laughs> until yeah until he's not <laughs> and you know and then also the only thing we we didn't talk about is Candace his his uh, first ex that he uh, accidentally thought he killed but didn't really kill coming back to haunt him basically just that, for the first two that seasons. was pretty good but I'm gonna jump now to season three is my favorite season and why I enjoy season three is my favorite season is because I think it is real i think it is something you see uh, in literature throughout time and that is most people have this time in their lives when they think they are the best and he absolutely thought he was the best serial killer could hide and torture people keep them locked up in his books <laughs> book vault if you will and um, do away with them and he felt totally empowered. He is definitely narcissistic. <laughs> um, he is definitely sadistic. Like, he has all of the problems. You start listing them off, 9 out of 10, <laughs> you can check those boxes. He's got those problems. And, and in season 3, though, what I love is up until the end, which had she chosen more wisely... His wife would have won victoriously, ultimately. But up until the end, he thought he was in power, but he had met his match. So here's an interesting thought here. You've been married. I've never been married. And I think when you look at season two, if you've been married, you can see a lot more aspects of, like, marriage in there. Like, dealing with, like, a baby crying all the time and, like, when they're young... Uh, just like kind of like the beginning stages of marriage, getting used to of people living together, probably. Um, See, I, I never experienced that like season two. For me, it was always a beautiful thing. I think when you experience it like that you do in season two is when couples are not married, when they are not truly partners. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. I think that's why season three is probably better for you, or I think season two is better for me, because season three, you're seeing like the marriage side of it, where season two is all about getting the woman. There you go. Also, with season three, you have people, in essence, chasing their dreams. Love starts her bakery. Joe actually builds a family until he kills it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that I think is most interesting when you transition from season two to season three is bet your bottom dollar, and if they don't do this, I'll actually be disappointed, but damn, they better have planned that Jenna Ortega comes in as one of his future interests. Oh, that might be interesting. Right. And then also, the son he gives up in season three um, leaves to two of his neighbors, so to speak. Doesn't co-workers. Really leave them. Co-workers. Co-workers. Um, leaves, to, yeah, because one was at the library and then his partner um, leaves his son, baby Henry, to his co-worker thinking that he being out of his son's life is the best thing in the long run, I, again, would think that before long, that will come back to haunt. Probably so. All right. Um, so here's another question to pose for both of us. Um, obviously, him killing people is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, Cocaine bear! <laughs> That being stated, do you really disagree with some of the things he did? Or could you see yourself doing something like that? I'm not saying I can see myself doing it, but at the end of each show, after Joe killed, I was like, yeah, man, I can't fault the guy. <laughs> <laughs> like, he kills his wife because she was, well, as I perceived it, uh, going to kill him. I thought she was going to try to preserve the family, and she only, like... Par try to paralyze him so therefore uh she could go ahead and eliminate the threat to the family that being the librarian librarian um so i think there's a little bit of questioning there between both you and i on that thought process um honestly i here's what i think 
I think Joe, and I think this is kind of, I think holds true probably maybe for a lot of men, uh, is that we want to provide for women, right? Or a, a gentleman would want to provide for a woman and would want to eliminate obstacles to make their life better or easier. So I don't fault Joe for that. And honestly, I don't think Joe purposely meant to kill the first guy. Like, I don't think he honestly, because, like, the guy did lie a lot. So I I don't think Joe really believed him about, like, his, like, peanut allergy or whatever. Um, Because I think he was trying, like, otherwise, I think if he wanted to kill the guy outright, he would have done so. Because if you go look at his history, the demented bookstore owner kept him in the cage until he re you know until he like learned his lesson or got rehabilitated and i think that's what joe was doing with the first guy with beck but i I don't think he purposely wanted to kill the guy but he ended up killing the guy (laughs) now is it precious i forget what her name is or the other the the her nickname was precious yeah (laughs) Her, like, I don't think he meant to kill her necessarily, but he did mean to knock her out with the rock, and because he hit her so hard, he killed her. I mean, that was precious. <laughs> My precious. I hated her. <laughs> oh, yes. I, dude, like, I'm, that's just it. She, the, was a, she was a bitch. At season one... And she did hold back back. Right. Season one, if you, for when I look at season one, every one of his kills, if you will. There's only two kills. Intentional or not. I was okay with. I was like cheering him on. I was okay with both of them because it did eliminate a evil within Beck's life to help her progress. Right. I'm just saying, you asked, like, would you do that? No. I had no problem with him doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I I concur. I have no problem with him doing it either. <laughs> uh, season two, I had no problem with him killing the uh, the comedian either. The guy was a you know was the pedophile, uh, giving like young girls uh, date rape drugs, and so I had no problem with him doing that either. Yeah, season two. I think that's. I think that whole situation is why I don't like revisiting season two. Is the fact that it was that dark and it wasn't like at that point. Yeah, that guy deserved death. It was beyond. Well, I have no problem with it. It was thank you. And you know, and he got he got what that guy Henderson got what he deserved. Uh, but then I think where things kind of got messed up for him is the landlord slash the older sister to Jenna, Jenna Ortega. She got a little bit too nosy and started like snooping around in his, uh, in his storage unit. She should have never gone to the storage unit to begin with. Note to selves. Do not go through your guy's storage. unit. <laughs> <laughs> so, and here he had the plan to let her go. Here's where I think, and he even like had everything set up, left the doors open, like put, put the, but he, he did put the timer, the timer handcuff lock on her. Hmm. Here's where I'll say the writing does well, and they try to make him look innocent. I think he intended every one of those skills. See, I'm not sure he he intended. I think the first season, yes. I agree. The first season, he intended. I think uh, the sister, I don't think he intended that kill. I think he intended every one of those kills, and I think what he was just doing was testing his own resolve around, oh, it's not really me killing you if you eat a peanut and I don't trust you that you have a (laughs) peanut allergy. Yeah, no, it still is you killing him. (laughs) That's what it is. Well, see here, because the reason why I don't think he, he meant to kill his sister because he wanted he wanted he he actually wanted to protect the younger sister but he knew he had to leave la and the only way to protect the younger sister was through the older sister so i think he wanted to let the older sister go plus he fear he figured that he could do that because he had that one guy in there in the in the early part of the season when the guy who he sold the name from and he let that guy go and the guy was trustworthy and became a friend of his 
which hopefully he comes back in the fourth season too. I'm telling you, I think there's going to be some weird twists, and I don't think it ends up like he's going to have to keep. It's going to become a killing spree at some point. <laughs> well, I think he's definitely on the wrong road. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think that kind of showed him that he could be like the bookstore manager, where he could put someone in that box, get them rehabilitated to what he thinks should be correct, and trust that person. So, and I thought he, he thought he could probably do that with his sister, but then that's where love comes in because love thought that that chick was a love interest of his and wanted to eliminate her. Two wrongs do not make it right. <laughs> <laughs> and she also killed Candace, which I think that was a kind of a good part on love's, on love's move there was killing Candace because Candace was like a, was a cancer to her brother and to Joe. I'm just going <laughs> to emphasize here. You have to like take a step back and really consider. Did you ever see any of the show Justified? Yes, I love that show. Me too. I literally think that's what Joe does with each one of these murders, um, killings, kidnappings, whatever you want to call them, different situations, different stages, is he just waits until he fully believes it's justified. Because at the end of the day, we all have to live with our choices. And he was like, okay, well, now I'm justified. Well, I think he was justified because he had to like buy himself some time to get out of L.A. So like giving her like a a timer or handcuff like that's really not his fault i mean it i'm is, telling first you. of all it yes he has this cage it is like it is storage unit but it's not his fault that she took the key and went to the storage unit i'm telling you justified <laughs> <laughs> all right anything else we want to say about this show i mean no it's an interesting show and it uh, I, I i am glad season four is on its way february yes February 8th for the first half of the season. I'm glad that is on the way. And it is interesting just to really sit back and uh, just think about, like, what do you agree with and not agree with? And there are some out there who will say, well, you know, you can't kill anyone. Um, and there's the flip side, which is we need the death penalty. And then there's the in-between. Uh, but at the end of the day, really looking at it and really thinking about, like, do you fault this character for their actions? And I'm not saying killing is good. None of that is good. None of that is ultimately right. But at the end of the day, I think the term justified is exactly how he sees it. How he sees it. <laughs> That's part of reading a great book or seeing a great movie in my mind is putting yourself in those shoes and whether or not you like it, really doing that. You know, Violent Night's a good example of that. If you're Santa Claus and, you, you know, like, let's face it, it's going to be a violent night. <laughs> um, you know, I, it, it's definitely justified in his mind. And I think, you know, when you look at his, uh, the way he grew up, um. It, it becomes a little bit, a lot more understandable, like why he does what he does. And it's funny because he keeps on getting the same lessons where he does something for a woman and then they don't appreciate it. So that's his problem is he keeps going after weak women. And that is. But then he goes after a strong woman and then he screws that up. He didn't go after her in the sense of he was going to kill her and he went she after her originally. went after him first. I think he went after love first. Because, like, like, second or third episode of season two, he talks about, like, how he started stalking her down. I think he found her attractive, but once he found out she didn't need him, it was, he was done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so with that being said, uh, give uh, you a watch on Netflix if you have Netflix, and uh, New Year, New You. Uh, I know like uh, one of my things I've mentioned to you since we're talking about New Year's, Happy New Year's, everyone who is watching this. Um, I uh, want to try to make more healthy choices this upcoming year. I definitely need to go to the gym more. <laughs> <laughs> or at least start again. Gym, uh, gym's a good place to go. <laughs> all right. Uh, 
with that, I guess, uh, what's our uh, next week's uh, topic in uh, Scotch? All right. So now that it is uh, finally available for easy viewing, the Smarter Challenge is the refurbished old The Glass Onion movie review. So we will be reviewing the movie The Glass Onion. And uh, with that, some of the similarities, dissimilarities, adaptations from Knives Out. And the scotch is the tail end that we didn't have last week. This is the Glen Glasgow Highland Single Malt Scotch Whiskey uh, that we will be enjoying next week, The Revival. So we're starting the year at the lump of coal. <laughs> This shit could be good. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm just just playing off of what you said last week. <laughs> I'm pretty confident it's not going to be a Love Harmony a collection <laughs> cocoa edition. <laughs> All right. Uh, so for everybody who uh, is uh, listening to us on uh, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, and all those, we thank you uh, for making us a good December. We beat last December, so that's great. Uh, we're, we are experiencing higher highs of listeners, or I should say higher lows. I mean, how high are they? <laughs> uh, higher lows in the amount of like downloads and uh, obviously higher highs since we're uh, finishing up uh, every month a little bit better. For those of you who watch us on YouTube and uh, Rumble, thank you very much for uh, watching us. Thank you to uh, subscriber number 60. I don't know who you are, but thank you out there, subscriber number 60. We greatly appreciate that. So please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. And remember, life is great. Please drink responsibly. Give us feedback. Let us know what you like, don't like. Uh, do you like more of the coin toss, some of the risky questions? Ultimately, uh, the one problem I saw with that is unless we do the coin toss the week before, all they have to do is look at the thumbnail and they know which scotch won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we don't. <laughs> So with that, please give us some feedback. Uh, again, drink responsibly. Life is great. Take care of your friends, family, and make sure they are helping take care of you. With that, Scotchman! Cheers. We hope you enjoyed this evening's episode of Scotch Hour. If you did, please like share and subscribe also if you have not done so already please become a patron member with memberships starting as low as one dollar a month thank you and hopefully you have a wonderful evening